self-publishing podcast episode number 57 welcome to the self-publishing podcast where if you want something done right you gotta do it yourself and now here are your hosts three guys who smell like dean spirit johnny sean and dave Hey everyone and welcome to the self-publishing podcast, the podcast that's all about how to get your words out into the world without contending with agents, publishers, or the other gatekeeping asswipes in <laughs> traditional publishing. I'm Johnny B. Truant and with me are Sean Platt eating strawberries and David Wright sporting a new and sexy look. <laughs> the funny thing is, I, I know that we just did the Smells Like Teen Spirit intro but since all three of us mentioned this is just this is how <laughs> disturbingly close we've all become all three of us mentioned in one email thread about this show that we uh like sean's like well i'm gonna be getting out of the bathtub and oh i didn't mention it but i i, I did said then go the to think shower tank, motherfucker i said think tank which we all know what that is that's fine but you can use the word bathtub but that's that word is for bitches i'm sure i'm just saying i did Okay, so he got out. Of, he's like, I'm going to go in the think tank. So I'm like, well, I'm going to go take a shower then. And then I get back to an email from Dave saying, just waking up and taking a shower. <laughs> so if you're wondering at home, yes, we do shower despite our appearances sometimes. And, and we did if we were thinking shower about, together. Yeah, if we were thinking about the podcast coming up, then we just had a menage a shower, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, were you as soapy there, as I was? <laughs> Oh boy! Where did the soap? I'm get glad I didn't places? eat. Um, yeah. yeah. I wonder if Garrett was showering. We were just. Oh, by the way, did you see the guy? Um, he's probably listening. His name's David. Uh, he replied on Better Off on Dead actually that the show had become all for about a, Garrett. an audience of one about Garrett. So yeah, let's mention him again. That's hilarious. He's working with us now, so he's gonna continue to come up in discussion. <laughs> yeah, he worked his he, ass off on the Roman Sands he, launch. Yeah, he he kicked ass on our Roman Sands launch this week because we had pretty much everything that could go wrong did. Um, I mean, we just had talk around those strawberries. <laughs> no, I'm done. Fuck you. All right, Speaking so, of professional, yeah. So we had um, our biggest problem was Amazon for some. Oh, actually, it's not for some reason. We know why it happened. We um. Full so Unicorn Western came out yesterday, the full saga, and we no, have wait, it out on. Just to clarify, yesterday, as we record this live, which is May twenty third, if you're listening on the podcast feed, it was a week ago. Not that that matters, I guess. So we so we had um, the full saga launched on the twenty third, and um, and it came out in print and Kindle. But what Amazon did is they. They counted the Kindle version um, of Full Saga as the same file um, as the, the book one. So when you clicked onto um, Unicorn Western Full Saga, it had 29 reviews. Which was awesome. Which was awesome, but, <laughs> um, but actually, I think Johnny was happier about that than I was. I'm not, because I think some of the... Um, I don't think Full Saga will get very many poor reviews. I think that... The, the people who are reading Full Saga will know what they're reading, where a lot of people who read the pilot, they're like, wait, 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 wait a minute. This Western has a unicorn, <laughs> right? <laughs> and did you notice that we're 69 on Westerns right now, the Full Saga? Uh, wait, what do you mean? Oh, full 60. Oh, yeah. the, the ranking is 69? The ranking, yeah, it's full. Um, what were you thinking of? <laughs> well, I don't know. I was like, dude, what are you doing under there? <laughs> so... Um, so we had we had a lot of sorting out to do on that. Garrett's on the phone with Amazon. Johnny was on the phone with Amazon later too. Yeah, so, actually, um, it was really annoying because it was one of those things where you manage to outsource something, and then somebody's they like, no, we got to talk to the account owner. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, uh, there there was formatting things. It was just one thing, and and our calls to action on this was were crazy. So we we wanted to have cross platform. So yesterday. It came out on um, Kobo, Barnes and Noble, and um, and Amazon. And by the end of the day, we pretty much said fuck Smashwords. Like we're not, like it's just not worth it. It's it's a meat grinder. Um, it's not Garrett. It's his formatting because I took the file and I said I just want to see if I can do this. And no, it wouldn't go. It's something in the way he's formatting it. 
that I think it's adding. Well, it's a not Smashwords there. problems; it's Garrett's problems. Well, but it's Smashwords no, but problems in their requirements. Okay, here's here's well, something. Well, they've eased their requirements now. No, they, it's not oh. consistent. He actually he actually put the right. He okay. So one thing that happened was he uploaded the file and they accepted it, but then he realized he put it under the wrong dashboard, so he unpublished it, published <laughs> it again, and they rejected it. It's the same file, <laughs> same file, no changes, nothing. So um. And it's just one of those like like trial and error, but you don't even have to change things. You just have to keep trying. Error and, and error. Yeah, time is just more valuable than that. You know that that's stupid. But anyway, like our, everything about it, like I love I love the way the product description looks. It's it's formatted very well. It's very cool. And a, a tip of the hat to Author Marketing Club and Jim Kukral. That's For his, that tool. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the tool that does the um the that allows you to format your descriptions like that. It was Garrett's idea. That's what's so. Because I, I feel a little bad because during the week, like, it was nutty and I got all stressed out. And then especially on the day before John, lunch, he I'm sent like, 47,391 emails this week. Right, but that's not because I'm a dick. It's because Sean <laughs> doesn't care. That's what it is. He's like, oh, you know. And so now I feel like I'm the Dave in this relationship. And... Um, and so, and so, and so I, I realize like I'm I'm just trying to get stuff right, but I'm probably like Garrett probably thinks that I'm all pissy, and he's probably you know, oh mad. he didn't think that he didn't think that at all. Well, but when when we said I'll something about did a good here. When, we, when we said something about him doing a good job, he was like he was like well it's um that's good to hear because you, you know like it was really and I'm like oh well, he said he know. was shitting his pants, but that's just because there's there was a lot to do. See, one of the things is our calls to act. We we did some cool things. I don't know is this gonna get too deep in the weeds? I think people care about. About this stuff, it's all I think. They, I stuff. think they care. I, th I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I would think hey, we would ought to care. announce we have a guest. <laughs> well, I, I usually announce it when the guest comes on and it's in the name, you but it is we're gonna it at have... the top of the show. Too. All right, but you want to you want to run this show, <laughs> bitch? It's um Mark from Kobo, and I'm gonna do the really professional thing where I have him come on and tell me how to pronounce his last name because it's like French. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is French, and but but Mark's an awesome, awesome guy. Dave and I have talked to him a, a few times, and I love Kobo. Oh my god, yeah. I can't wait to get him on here and kiss his butt because it's. I put stuff on up, up on Kobo. I have sold about one third as many Fat Vampire value packs on Kobo as I have on Amazon, and it hasn't. I just put them on like two weeks ago. It's yeah, insane. Kobo based on their their layout their presentation like they deserve to succeed and big shout out to joanna penn too because she was on the kobo train like a year ago you know when, yeah. when we were well, amazon she, she's also she's also in europe where they're bigger i right? am making a note right but that doesn't matter she was still look you guys don't ignore them like don't I ignore am making them a note like, right know now doing. to email joanna and then joanna if you're listening and i forget email me because we'd like to have you back on and i keep forgetting yeah we totally totally would uh um, you were talking about launch and stuff so, so our, our launch was, yeah, we're, we're doing, we're, we're trying to be pretty um, aggressive, um, smartly aggressive on, on the marketing front for Realm and Sands. You know, Johnny and I both come from that background and, and want to make that kind of core of what we do. So, um, so some of our decisions right out of the gate were, um, for example, uh, we, we have two different promotions that we're running on the social front to both drive reviews and attention. And um, they're all CTA based. Like things have to be linked. We had to put a couple sites up. So, for example, um, and they all have to be different. They, the Kobo calls to action have to, you know, go to the Kobo link, and the Barnes and Noble ones have to go to the Barnes and Noble link. Right. And we're we. I mean, again, part of our 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 whole methodology here is that we launch cross platform. So on Thursday, we wanted it all available at Kobo, at um, Barnes and Noble at um, uh, Amazon and we wanted it all at the same time. Now, now next week is going to be cake comparatively because next week is only, you know, Unicorn Western 5 will come out um, and all the calls to action are taken care of. All the accounts are set up on the different platforms. It, it, it should be so much easier, but this was our first one. So there was a lot to handle and take care of. And so one of the things that we did is, is a sharing thing. So uh, the first Unicorn Western starts in this town called Solace and this, um, this bad guy named Hasselstone, um, you know, comes back to terrorize the town after Clint, the main character, has kicked him out several years before. So Johnny and I wrote a story called The Outlaw Hasselstone, 
that takes place the first time Clint rides into Solace and rids the town of Hasselstone. And the only way to get that story is to share Unicorn Western, um, the free one, the book one, which is perma-free, um, which is the lowest friction. If you share that on Facebook, you get, um, you get that short story free. It's 5,000 words, and, and we wrote it. And if you're interested in us, I totally just interrupted you, but that's the way it is with Sean. If I don't interrupt him, I can't talk. <laughs> that's totally it's, true. You're justified. It, it, unicornwestern.com slash hassle dot or dash stone if you're curious about that anyway go. And, and so so if you share it then you get the, the story and it's 5,000 words but we only wrote it for that share now I'm sure we'll do something else with it later but it was worth it to us to write a 5,000 word story that was just for sharing and um, the other thing we did is uh, our next um, our next project is well, our next project in the unicorn universe is Unicorn Genesis, which is um, t all takes place before Western. And um, we already have written the first book in Genesis. And, um, and you can only get that. It's a call to action at the end of the full saga. The only way to get that is to review the full saga. And you can get it at this point. It's what, three months early, Johnny? June, July, August? Almost four months early. Um, so... That's really cool because if you think about it, the person that you most want to review um, the full saga is somebody who would be keenly interested in reading Genesis. That's your most ideal reviewer. They read all nine books, they were invested, and they care enough to go read what's next and leave a review to get it. So you're, you're kind of putting a fine point on who you want to review the book also. Um, so anyway, there was just, and that was another call to action on the Unicorn Western site that we had to have all those links set up. So there was just a lot to do. Um, and, and genuine big shout out to Garrett for um, tidying so many loose ends and dotting eyes. And yeah, and what I started to say was that it was his idea to use that. We didn't, neither of us said, hey, use that tool. He's like, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make this flow chart that'll make everything easy and I'm going to. That flow know, chart was the best part of my day. I'm not even kidding. Like, I, like I saw that, and I'm like, okay, this is this is perfect. This is who you want to invite into your environment. Somebody who gets it. This A, is how you you and I are different because I looked at the flow chart and I said that's awesome, and I'm going to totally ignore it because that's shit I don't have to worry about. No, but that's the point. That's the point. Somebody else is worrying about it. Somebody else is saying, look, here's like, it's not that I needed to study the flow chart. It's that Garrett thought to make a flow chart, and then. Yeah that he's now making it so next week is easier. Next week has fewer problems. I know that the system is going to be better next week than this week, and that gives me confidence that it will be better the week after that. So is That's that your flowchart? Flow chart. <laughs> that is Dave's flowchart. Oh, my God. It's worth going to YouTube just to see Dave's flowchart because it's accurate. <laughs> it looks like someone farted is, is what it looks like. <laughs> That's not what that looks like. <laughs> it looks like an atom to me. Chaotic. Yes, I am an atom full of energy waiting to explode. That's that's you always seem so full of energy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, uh, Johnny's emails were funny too because um, they're all like, "Fuck yeah, fuck yeah, it's launch day!" Yeah, <laughs> like they were so excited. Which which really a wrestler? Is, no, it really is awesome because I, I I get that excited too and. Um, okay, I'll send e I'll send Dave an email. Yay! It's the White Space Two is coming out. Yippee! Period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I Every show my excitement in different ways. Well, I'm well, more subtle. with an erection. <laughs> yes, we, we have we have we have story meanings, and he's like, "Hey." <laughs> It went, oh God! <laughs> all right, we're gonna we're gonna talk the finale today. Yay! Another season. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys want to do um, one of these voicemails before we get uh, Mark on? Uh, yeah, sure. All right. So this is about, is it about Amazon World? Oh, should we talk you know about what? that? We that may be a good beat better off undead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At the end of the show, we'll announce th that, and then we're gonna we'll carry the conversation into better off undead. All right. All right. So that sounds good. So I'm going to play voicemail from Nikki uh, about our typical day. This should be fun since we know Dave doesn't have a typical day. <laughs> hey guys, it's Nikki. I know you don't know who I am, but I feel like I know you guys thanks to your self. Oh, I know you, man. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's an awesome show. I love it. I really like the the workman attitude you guys have. And my question for you today is, 
I would like to know what a typical day looks like for you guys. Do you have your time scheduled in blocks? Do you go with the creative flow when it hits you? Um, you know, how do you work around your kids? How do you work around the homeschool thing? How do you divide up your writing time and your marketing time? Um, I think that I'm really curious about that, and that would be very helpful for me to hear. And thank you so much. Who wants to go first? Well, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the example of what not to do. <laughs> I am like the, what are those two guys? Rod and Rob or whatever. <laughs> the <laughs> bad example, the good example. I wake up, I figure it out. <laughs> I wake up, I curse my life, and then I go to work. Uh, now, actually, you know, I, I've been very, very interested in procedure and um, reading a lot about how different writers and artists work. It, it fascinates me as I'm trying to, like, figure out my most productive way. It uh, looks like Sean's going right now. He's probably going to take another bath. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, 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 t I tend to try to work with, you know, my energy levels. So depending how I feel, I know Johnny and Sean wake up and hit it immediately. I can't do it. I, I need to be in more of a groove. I can sit down and force myself to write, but it always takes so much longer than if I actually sit down when I'm ready to write. Um, it, it's just like, you know, pounding my head against a wall. But I, I think different people work different ways and you got to experiment and find different ways. Now, Sean and Johnny will tell you the right way to do it. Well, no, that's how C.J. Lyons said she does hers, is she doesn't work by a schedule. Okay. And when, when the way this works is Dave says something, and then C.J. agrees, and Sean and I go, ah, okay, yeah, I see that. And then it works the other way, too, where <laughs> C.J. says something that Sean and I agree with, and Dave goes, ah, okay, I see that. C.J.'s like the perfect harmony of all of us. <laughs> yeah, you want to go next, Regular, Sean? for sure. Um, yeah, um, I I try to plan um, as much as I can, but I, I'm pretty adaptable too. Um, I think the the key for me mostly is trying to improve on what I did, you know, the the month before. Um, I I do I do keep track, so I know you know what projects take what time, and you know I try to trim the fat when I can. Um, Typically right now, um, and, and yes, I do work in blocks, so I, I know about how much time a certain thing will take, um, and, and I block it out, but I have to be adaptable. So, for example, this morning I had it blocked out that I would be working on um, a, a project that I'm writing with Garrett in the morning, and then um, I'd have a first read-through of Johnny's latest um, work on the beam at the end of the day. But I, I had to I had to flip those because Johnny turned it in early, and um, and Garrett because he got you know caught in the weeds on lawn stuff all week um, didn't have his stuff. So, Slacker. So I just I just but it but it's pretty easy. I just went to the calendar and flipped those blocks, you know, because they're the same blocks. It's just okay now this project goes up and this project goes down, and and coincidentally, I was able to do it because they very neatly switched places with one another. But um. You know, norm, right now I'm trying to get all my writing, like my heavy writing and stuff done before one in the morning. I mean, sorry, one in the afternoon. <laughs> and, and, my uh, hours. And, and then, you know, I handle email and, and stuff like this later. And then I try to get one more, like, cool block in later. But those are always harder. Like today I know I won't. I'm pretty much done writing for the day, even though I, I have a lot to do and want to do more. Um, it, it won't happen. I'm rather schedule driven and I've mentioned before I have a writing block from 6 to 9 a.m. on every weekday. I don't work on uh, weekends and I don't work in the after the uh, evenings unless I absolutely absolutely have to and that's really rare. So it's a 3 hour and block. And you're resentful in the morning. when you do, right? Like it's like I I want to punch people in the face when I do. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm very, very diligent during my work time, and so I'm protective of my play time. So it's just like, well, fuck that. Why did I work so hard and now I got to do other shit? So um, I do that, and then on every day, um, other than Tuesday and Friday, I have a tw uh, like an hour and a half block because that's about how much energy I have left to write. And Friday, I know I have no energy, so I'm working with my own uh, stuff because it's Friday. I'm working with my own tendencies, and so I move that block to Tuesday, so I have a double on Tuesday. But basically, those big writing blocks, and then the middle of the day is pretty open. So um, we do homeschool. That was just me, I believe. And um, 
but it's um, it's we don't do like I, people have different ways of doing homeschooling, and ours is much more. Um, it, it's quasi unschooling, although I don't really identify with that anymore. So it's a lot of self-driven stuff and the sort of thing that I can kind of get them going on. And um, my wife is home several days, so basically it doesn't impact me very much at all in terms of my schedule. And uh, but but like yesterday or on Wednesday, the day before launch. Austin and I went up to the art museum all day, just in the middle of the day. That's one of the things we do, and we do stuff like that. Um, I usually, if I go, to, I go to the gym three days a week, and I do that around ten, and just clean up loose ends before my other writing block. Sometimes, you know, like one one day, Sean and I have a story meeting that's a regular time every week. Uh, I record another podcast. I didn't hear that part. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, once a week. It's always at one. And then actually the way we're doing it now is one to two is Sean and I, and then Garrett and Sean is two to three, and I sit in for the beginning of that for overlap, which is a real good process thing. Uh, so basically writing and then just kind of gathering loose ends, writing, you know, lo uh, CTAs, whatever. I'm doing less and less of the marketing sorts of things because uh, I've outsourced that a lot to my partners, which is nice. So I don't know. Did we thoroughly answer that? Let me invite Mark while we're tidying this one up. But did I answer that sufficiently? Yeah, I, I think the key really is to to lean into your own habits, um, you know, and and be adaptable. And um, I, I mean, I'm I'm a little jealous of Johnny actually. Um, I think that that it's awesome. That he does. Well, totally actually, <laughs> but but specifically, um, in, in at least in terms of writing <laughs> scheduling, his. Oh. Um, not working in the evenings and not working on the weekends. I think that's awesome. I have I have too much on my plate. I work every day. Um, I try to work less in the evening. I actually do work less at night now than I ever have. So that's actually awesome. Um, but I want to get to a point where I, I can I can design my schedule a little bit better. I don't think I'll be there for about six months, um, but but I absolutely plan to. And th I think the key is in trying to get better. Don't beat yourself up when you mess up. Um, but you know, always try to design a better schedule than the one you had before, and um, you'll get you'll get more and more done. I mean, really, keep track. It's like if you don't can't sleep, well, don't sleep. <laughs> no, you actually should sleep. Ideally, in my ideal schedule, I actually sleep for thirty minutes during the day, from three to three thirty. I love it when I can nap it from three to three thirty. That's awesome. A nap with his binky. And the other part you know, is with my wife, you fucker. <laughs> the other part is that this is sort of the macro level. If you if you're on YouTube, uh, you can see this. It's just basically I printed out calendar pages and wrote in what I'm doing on every day. So Sean and I uh, sync on when things are due. So it's like we just spent a lot of our story meeting last time talking about when the Realm and Sands release schedule is. So for instance, next week uh, is next Thursday is Unicorn Western Five. Uh, after that is our uh, sitcom, Everybody Gets Divorced, the pilot for that, and so on. So we have those, and I I then fill in, well, I'm going to work on this at this time, and then I pass it back to Sean, like, does that make sense if I get this to you at this day so that you have time to either polish, either, you know, edit it, and then I polish it, which is Unicorn Western in the beam, or I don't see it again, but you need time to get it to an editor and back, which is the other projects. So it just there's a lot of syncing on when things will move back and forth between us, and and even with that, we're pretty adaptable on on moving blocks. Um, you know, for example, we we dropped the better off on dead sitcom. We doubled beam. You know, we should talk about oh, that. Oh God, week, I got I forgot know? about that. Sean is like, hey, let's double the length of the beam. <laughs> Dave, and I, I was Sean just like, is like that. <laughs> yeah, and I I was totally having a Dave moment, and I was like, am I? Can I get? Pissed. I mean, I can't get pissed because it, it's really awesome. But I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? It's the <laughs> hardest project. It doesn't add any more weeks to our release schedule. It's still, it's still seven weeks. It's still a season and six episodes. They're just really long. So we haven't done anything other than increase our workload and theoretically our profit and the awesomeness of the story. But at but, launch, when we're trying to get ahead, I'm like, God damn it, are you yeah, kidding me? I don't me? think Johnny would have even flinched if it was three months from now. I think it was that it was... It, it, Imminent. At the time, it was, yeah, it was like, okay, we got to do this now. But, but um, you know, last weekend, I spent, um, I spent, I spent the weekend Ooh. just mapping out um, 45 scenes we had left to write. Oh, God, yes. So I, I was mapping out those scenes. And I'm like, okay, what can we cut to make this a a really great first season? And 
no matter what, it just it was incomplete. Like it just wouldn't be a, a satisfying enough reading experience. And this is good shit. Like if we pull the beam off, which so far I really feel confident that we are, um, it 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 needs full breadth. It, it needs the full one hundred and eighty thousand words <laughs> to tell the first season. So um, so that's important. So we're 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 doing that. And um, um, well. Anyway, the point is we have to be adaptable even within our schedule. But but we're really good about our story meetings. We never miss them, and they're um, we either talk process or story. Um, so we have the same slot in our schedules, no matter what we're talking about. Oh, there we go. And Mark is here. Thank God, I was getting bored with that conversation. Yeah, I accidentally sent to the wrong uh, the, the wrong email address. Mark, um, it, it, we can't see you yet, so there may be a settings thing in the upper right hand corner if you. I uh, need to turn on your camera or whatever. And in the meantime, we'll just Nor talk can we hear him. Sure. Right, we can't hear you either. Oh, there so. we go. <laughs> Yay. Hi, Mark. Hello. Mark, uh, <laughs> but so before I give you... As I do. <laughs> before I give you an intro, I have to do the really unprofessional thing where I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Oh, and we can't hear him. Oh, I love this is on. a game we play. How's that sound now? Is that better? There that's you go. Better. All right. uh, that's why, because you're not supposed to pronounce my last name. Uh, <laughs> Lefebvre, the way you pronounce that. Yeah, if you watch to... Talkie, you would know that. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Anyway, you are uh, you're with Kobo. I don't know officially. Or I'd say I'm really professional. Um, we know you as Kobo okay. Mark, right? Like he's the guy we talk to at Kobo. <laughs> and um, I just like to give you a compliment, Mark, because um, I've never seen anybody as on top of things. Just like I got an email about, I pulled uh, just a quick story. I had Smashwords feeding uh, the, some like Fat Vampire One free onto uh, Kobo. You can do that, and I pulled it off. And I was going to then put a Kobo specific version so that I could have a link that, to the Kobo version of the the value meal, my my pack. And I was like, when I get done, I have to email Mark and say, you know, here's the new one and all this. And it, like, I get an email, hey, where'd, the, where'd it go? <laughs> <laughs> Way on top of things. Thank you. So, um, I, I seem to have jumped into the podcast in, in mid-sentence. I don't want to take you guys away from the path. Oh, there. no, no, no. Oh, Sean was just going on and on <laughs> about his routine. <laughs> <laughs> you saved us and the audience. You did. You okay. did. Uh, Johnny, my official title at Kobo is Director of Self-Publishing and Author Relations. So now I'm having oh, uh, relations with authors with right now. Relations. Yeah, that's awesome. Not so, those kinds of relations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. We, we were just showering. You, you were in our thoughts, I think. <laughs> so how, can you, can you give us an idea because, um, I mean, we talked a little bit about this. Like Amazon gets all the press and stuff because they're kind of the big dog and everybody knows them. But um, I love what I've seen with Kobo so far. So what's, what are the differences in, like, if somebody's publishing on Amazon, what do they need to know about publishing on Kobo? What's just the, the whole ecosystem thing? Okay, so Kobo is, just to give, uh, give your listeners a bit of a background, Kobo is a Canadian company. It was founded in Toronto a little over three years ago. The, uh, and it's available in just under 200 countries around the world. It's obviously very popular in Canada. Uh, we initially had partnered with Borders in the U.S. Uh, didn't work out so well for us there because there is no more Borders. Uh, in ter in territories that we move into, we only sell ebooks. So we partner with a retailer, typically a retailer that sells books, so we can each do what we do best. Uh, right now, we're partnered with the American Booksellers Association in the U.S. So we're we're back in the U.S. with a with a bit of a presence. And the idea there is you could go to your local independent bookstore website. And purchase Kobo ebooks from their website, meaning you can buy ebooks and still support the local bookstore. So that's the kind of business that's awesome, model that by the we've way. created. Yeah. Um, it's it's open, social, and collaborative. Kobo Writing Life was kickstarted last year, just after a Book Expo America, and uh, so it was the middle of July that we actually went live. And I think some of the other differentiators that you know we like to say uh, different from the big uh, different from the big player in the field. It, is uh, Kobo Writing Life was created 
by writers for writers. I was hired into this position because I'm, a, I'm an author. I self-published my first book back in 2004, back when it was icky and uh, it was a <laughs> career kill move to, to go into self-publishing. Uh, I am traditionally published as well, so when we put Kobo Writing Life together, we kind of tried to put it together from the point of view of what does an author really need to be successful, recognizing the value for authors to be on all platforms, not on a single uh, exclusionary proprietary platform, mm -hmm. and what can we do to be part of the community and continue to make it better. I mean, one of the reasons I reached out to you guys was uh, I saw you guys were doing different kinds of things with writing, and I wanted to see... Um, what we could do uh, to help sell um, more of your products uh, in different territories, potentially in different territories that you hadn't been selling well in before. I'm hoping it's been a good experiment so far for you. Oh, yeah, it's been great. It's been amazing, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just... Uh, I know that it's, we had somebody on the last show ask about numbers, so I'm just I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some numbers. I, I've been on Kobo about three weeks, and I've already made like 200 bucks, right? So that's but that's brand new. I mean, I don't I'm not in the whole. I don't have that's a following just Kobo. there the, yet. The point that is, it's it's Kobo's ecosystem. You didn't send an email, nothing. You just no, put I didn't stuff do anything. And, up. and the, yeah. the, the 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 my value pack, like the, the the end point of my current funnel, has only been there like a week and a half. So I made the executive decision to just say, let's just put this, I probably shouldn't admit to this, let's just put this up and uh, put it up now. And uh, Select just booted me out uh, about a week early. <clears throat> um, but anyway, so I, I just did that. And, and did you just notice how going. comfortable you made Dave? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I like to make Dave uncomfortable because it's just me. It's just Johnny B. Truant. Uh, I'm officially out of, of Select across the board. And um, I, but uh, what what bugged me a while ago, like back when we were still talking a lot about Amazon, all you know, saying let's do select, is it bothered me on a level that I couldn't, um, I didn't have the justification to proceed away from it. But it it bothered me that all the eggs were in one basket, like the idea that a Amazon, we were sharecropping on Amazon's land basically, and any change they made would you know. It, it could kill us. And and the other thing, like everything I'm selling now is in Canada. So I'm like, well, is Amazon's reach? Apparently I wasn't reaching all the Canadians. I, uh, I'm gonna, I sell on Amazon as well. And I think I actually sold my very first uh, book uh, in Canada on Amazon today. I was wow. very excited. Wow. About that. Yeah, I was very thrilled. I, I will say that on uh, for Sean and I, uh, our Yesterday's Gone series, we had it up for, I don't know, about a year over at Barnes & Noble and Apple and uh, Lulu. Uh, and I think I don't know if we had the whole thing at Smash. Or, at any rate, we we sold like one percent of what we did at Amazon uh, in that same time frame. And already on Kobo, we've been on a month or maybe two months now. I'm not even sure, but it, it's already doing very well, uh, well surpassing the one percent we sold in an entire year. So. Um, yeah, and the and there these are new readers. I mean, that's the thing. Like, we're getting people on. Yeah, we're getting email from Canadians. We, yeah, we didn't. These are people who did not know who we were. Two months I didn't ago. know Canada had email. And, and <laughs> we just got it last week. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and what's awesome about that is that these. I mean, and and we our first talk with with Mark was I don't know like four or five months ago when we were talking about. But moving yesterday's gone, but at the time we wanted to move our entire catalog over, but we had literally like just clicked the button on most of our titles for another three months and we just had to wait through it. But we have a whole catalog. So if somebody finds us through yesterday's gone or whatever they find us through and, and they dig what they read, they've got a whole um they, they, they've got our whole catalog to go look at. And that's really awesome. So every new reader that we get is very, very important because some of those will be lifetime readers. And you never know where the reader is going to be coming from, and you never know when that reader uh, on a platform different than one single platform could become your biggest fan and your right. biggest champion and part of your street team and all that other great stuff. And somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who that's where everything changes. Bingo. Mark, what, what do we need to know is there anything different that a self-publisher needs to know when they go into Kobo versus uh, versus Amazon? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I mean, one thing that uh, I like to tell all authors is that sometimes the overnight success takes a lot of work. Um, yeah. Sometimes you're on a platform for a while before your readers discover you, and, and, and that just takes time. And, and that goes for all platforms, not just Kobo. Yeah. The, I think the other thing is, 
you may find, and I think Johnny and Dave, uh, or uh, Sean and Dave, sort of alluded to that, is that you know you suddenly had Canadian fans where you didn't have Canadian fans. A little bit of evidence uh, as to our pull in the Canadian market. But I think a couple things that are, are good to know is, no, you don't need to have an ISBN. Uh, if you do have an ISBN, uh, you can put it in there. And uh, that's just for the benefit of our retail partners. So, for example, here in Canada, uh, we have Kobo.com is available uh, around the world. Uh, so your title will automatically be available everywhere if that's where you choose to make it available. Um, I think uh, some of our retail partners won't accept the dummy ISBN that we assign if you don't give it a real ISBN, but they're very, very few. But we like to be honest with our customers. So I think WH Smith in the UK uh, is uh, confirmed to be one of our retail partners who won't accept the dummy ISBNs. Now, that means that anyone in the UK can still buy your books from Kobo.com in the UK, but if they're browsing on WH Smith's website for eBooks, it may not show up, uh, hmm. only because the dummy number isn't a legitimate ISP. And it's very similar to the ASIN uh, that Amazon uses internally. Um, free is uh, something that you can do at any time. So one of the differences yeah, between us that. and the uh, select program is we figure if free is part of your strategy, and it's not necessarily the best strategy for everyone, for every uh, particular catalog, but if, if you have a beautiful gateway drug <laughs> title that can help uh, lure people into your universe. Free can work really, really well. Um, I mean, if you've only got one book to sell, you, you don't think free is going to do much for you. I have a, I have a question um, about You can make free it free at any time. Um, what was that? Sorry, Sean? Well, for free, do you... Because I, I know you can make it free at any time, which is really fantastic. I love that. Um, but you don't have any like featured free or anything like that, right? Is is that anything that Kobo is planning to do at any point? We are. Uh, we are. Um, I've got, uh, so just to give you an idea, Shana, who I stole from our merchandising team uh, to work on the Kobo Writing Life team, uh, helps uh, manage some of the promos. And, um, and one of the things that we're looking at is the different things that we can do to give uh, our authors a bit more of a profile or a bit more of a spotlight. So we kind of have been experimenting with some of the existing free lists that are out there, and uh, and and some of the some of the effect has worked uh, worked really really well in terms of uh, of doing that. And of course, we're going to selectively pick things that look like they're a good funnel. Right. potentially for, for a, a publisher or an author's catalog um, because we know that sometimes just giving stuff away for free, all you're really doing is giving, giving stuff away for stuff free. Away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, but, but, we are a business. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that uh, we only make money. I mean, we make very little money when we sell a device, when we sell our Kobo readers. Uh, we make money by selling content. So if all we did was give away free stuff, that wouldn't be a good business model for us to be around. So no, you're, you're, you're a PlayStation. Right. Yeah, we're trying to strategically say, hey, check out this crack. This crack is really, really good. You should try this, and then maybe you'll be hooked and you'll come back and buy some. Uh, so the whole the serialized kind of... or, or multiple, um, multiple titles, I mean... Series at, books. Right, so Yesterday's Gone yeah. um, season, I mean, that, that first episode, that's permanently free, but it would make sense in that context for Kobo to highlight it because it, yeah. it leads to... Twenty other dollars worth of, of products. And, and on a totally separate topic, we just published the Unicorn Western Full Saga. That would be a good funnel, maybe. I'm just, just say. I saw <laughs> that. Yeah, I saw. I went live yesterday or the day before. Yeah. Yesterday. A little plug. Very, very yep. subtle. Yep. I'm not. I'm not saying that if you give it some some love, that we'll talk about how great Kobo is. But let me put it this way: if you give it some love, we'll talk about how great Kobo is. Be a Kobo <laughs> painting behind. Have you had any tomorrow. sales on it yet? I haven't. Uh, I haven't checked. Uh, I last time I checked, I no, but it's only been a day. So. Yeah, and sometimes it takes more than a day. <laughs> I have, Imagine yes, that. I, <laughs> That's the best quote I have, ever. <laughs> I have a few. Uh, I have a few questions for you about some eccentricities of Kobo that that I know about. Um, first of all, is I don't know that other retailers do this, but. 
you can link to Goodreads. Oh, you know what? We did. I just looked. We sold. We just sold our first one. Yay! Oh, I awesome. bet you it was a it was it was a viewer watching this live said, "Oh my God! Now I can get it on Kobo." Thank God. <laughs> yes. uh, you can link to you can link your your product to um, to uh, your Goodreads reviews, which is awesome because in the Kobo ecosystem. I don't have a lot of um, reviews because you know I'm brand new there. But in Goodreads, I have like hundreds of reviews, and so if you hook those up, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, Fat Vampire has 130 reviews, and they're largely positive. Now it's but, weighted with the the Goodreads metric, but sorry, Dave, what? Well, I, I interrupted you. I, I was just going to interject. Uh, does Kobo have its own reviews? I didn't think that it did. No, no, we don't. We we again in okay. our partnership with best in class we thought goodreads has a great ecosystem for reviews so we partnered with them uh, even though they're owned by that other Amazon. place um, we're still not friends with goodreads no, okay. we're still we're, we're still friends with goodreads now we uh, we have gotten a lot of requests from people who want to be able to do reviews directly because um, if customers want to review, we say, well, go to Goodreads and they'll, they'll show up. Um, I should let you guys know that the Goodreads reviews are linked by the ISBN, so you have to have a listing on Goodreads that includes the EISBN that you've entered or the dummy ISBN, which shows up on your item page. There's a fantastic, I can send you guys this for the show notes, there's a fantastic um, blog article on CobaWritingLife.com, originally written by a Cobra Writing Life author who basically figured it out and created a whole bunch of screenshots. His name's Eric, fantastic sci-fi writer, so you got to give some props to him. Um, but there's a great link that shows you how to do it if you, if you um, if for example, the only thing listed on Goodreads is your ASIN or the print book or what other, uh, what other, um, ISBN is there, so you can create uh, an additional entry and then uh, and then combine them. And I think Johnny, I, that's how you got your reviews to show up on Kobo right away. And and I love hearing that you don't have your own reviews, honestly. Now here's why: Goodreads reviews are notoriously about one star lower. And if you understand that, like if you look at your Amazon reviews and your Good Star reviews, it's like a half to one star lower on average because Goodreads uses a different metric, like. Four stars is I really liked it on Goodreads, whereas Amazon I really liked it is usually good enough for five stars. And so, if you guys had your own reviews and only some people were doing the Goodreads reviews, it might look like you had a lower average. But now everybody's doing that. Like I kind of like that. Yeah, they're they're critical across the board, right? Since the Goodreads reviews tend to be a right. little bit more of the uh, angry <laughs> critic. Right. Well, yes. they're, they're readers that love their books, and they take the reviews seriously. Yeah, those so. reviews don't bother me at all. Because I, I've come what, around on on that. Yeah, it it is the consistency. If they were like harder on on genre fiction, for example, that would be one thing. But it really seems like it's not that your stuff is one star lower. It's all stuff is one star lower. And look, let let's be real. Dave and I, for example, have a lot of reviews. We have 500 reviews on um, season one of BSJ's Gone. And I'm really appreciative of those reviews. But honestly, we have more five-star reviews than we deserve. Five stars is like the best thing ever written. Five stars is the best you can get. I think Yesterday's Gone is a very solid four-something star book. It's not five-star. I'm so appreciative of our five stars, and it's what I would review if I was going to review Yesterday's Gone and I didn't write it. I'd give it five stars because I'd really dig it, but it's not actually one of the best things ever written, which is what five stars should be. So Goodreads is just a little more of a... Um, it's a little more accurate. It's a little more... It may be harsher, but as long as it's harsh across the board, I think that's totally fair. Okay, what were your other thoughts on uh, eccentricities in Kobo, Johnny? Uh, well, the other one, the, the, uh, that's, a, that's a really positive one. And the other one that I have that's a little bit different that I heard um, is that linking to books is a little different because you guys have a system where the URL will change when you update, upload yeah. a new version. Can you give me the background on that? Yeah, so it, it kind of stems back to, I'm sure you've heard the, the, you must have heard the horror story of when Amazon removed 1984 from everyone's libraries a few years yes. ago. I, I okay. never heard that it until because... Sean told me all about it. <laughs> <laughs> the um, that's that was because I mean they they were doing the right thing, but they they went about it wrong uh, because they shouldn't have been able to make that available. It was a mistake. But what happens is so you download an EPUB to your library or to your e-reader, e and you and you bookmark it. So uh, for example, 
Oh, you know, when I was reading Yesterday's Gone, I think I started reading it on my Kobo Glow, um, and then I bookmarked it. And then because it's bookmarked in the cloud, when I picked up uh, on my on my iPhone, I could pick up reading exactly where I left off on uh, season one on a different device, which was cool. Those bookmarks are tied to a volume ID, which are tied to that specific version of the EPUB. So if uh, Sean and Dave were to upload a new version of the EPUB, it's not going to automatically push and overwrite the one that I have in my library because I may want to preserve my bookmarks. I may have even made notes and highlights and all the things that readers like to do with the books that they own. So they have the option to manually say, okay, give me the most recent one, but then any new person who buys it gets the most recent one. Side effect to that is we have to create new volume IDs and the volume ID, the most recent volume ID is what lives on the website. Now, the, the sad news about that, uh, and this is a bug that is being, uh, has been addressed already and is going to be rolled out very soon, uh, probably within the next uh, few weeks uh, to a month, is that it also, you end up losing what we call your temperature or your sales ranking. And if there were any, uh, you know, starred reviews right within Kobo's ecosystem, those would be, those would be lost as well. Now, the good news is the fix has been done in place. I can actually see in the content system how all the new volume IDs are all automatically linked. So all of your sales history, all of your temperature, all of your rankings will get propagated to the most recent ISBN. And if a customer clicks the link from any of those old volume IDs, instead of getting an error message, it's going to automatically bring them to the most recent version. Um, now, to get, a, to get around that, we've created, there's actually an um, ISBN equals link, which is a beautifully nice short URL. Again, I can send you some of this for the show notes, but basically it's a, a really short USL, uh, a URL where you just replace the 13-digit ISBN. And, oh. and, and, and you didn't, an ISBN Sean, Sean you, didn't, you didn't know that, Sean? Because I, I noticed know. that you linked to it wrong in your, in your email, but I fixed it in mine. Yeah, no, um, yeah. Ed Robertson had a thing about this. So basically, if you do a search, so if I go to Kobo and I search for Johnny, you look at the URL, it'll say Kobo, blah, 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 question mark equals Johnny. And if you replace that, what you just searched for in the URL with the ISBN that Kobo gives you, that link is the way you're supposed to and link the it. ISBN can be found on the product page on the lower right side, I believe. That's a cool yeah, one. bottom, bottom right-hand side. So did you, did you, you mentioned that that's being changed, is it, it but it's not yet, right? Well, the ISBN uh, search will still be there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so the back end, I can see that those volume IDs are linked in the content system, and the web, uh, the release to the web hasn't been pushed out yet. So it's, it's very imminent that, that that would automatically be fixed. Now, here's why I like it from a, a standpoint. And typically, you guys own world rights for all of your stuff. Let's, let's go back to Hugh Howey. Uh, so before Hugh sold the print book rights to Simon & Schuster, he had his ISBN for the UK, which was owned by Random House, uh, and he sold the digital rights to Random House, but in the US and Canada and the rest of the world, he had his self-published ISBN for wool. What would happen is if I go and link to that book on uh, Kobo, um, a friend of mine in the UK would click on it and they would be told, sorry, you can't buy this because there's no rights to that because Random House bought the rights to it in the UK that volume ID linking that we have in the system would now say you're trying to see this book which is only available in Canada but in your territory here's the version so for authors who are doing hybrid solutions yeah. or who have sold different territory rights it just allows an easier way for customers in different territories to be able to talk about the same books and at least buy them so you know you, you potentially don't lose that sale with a broken link and um, and with the with any changes or adjustments you don't you don't lose the temperature right which you is change the book six times a day if you're really excited about that uh, you could <laughs> John that would and... do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah we no, got I would outsource it. yeah <laughs> and in one of them you put a golden key and if you find the golden key then you do win the prize <laughs> Um, that I would did get be an, awesome. Is, that would be pretty but, cool. It, it, well, no, that's a whole rabbit hole. Never mind. I like that Sean has started to identify the rabbit holes. Usually you just go down them. Now he's like, wait a minute. It's well, like biofeedback. No, we, we have a guest. guest. Otherwise, we'd spend the Otherwise, we, I would have I would have dove head first. Uh, Mark, usually Dave is really defensive of the guest's time. And Sean and I, we, we, don't, we don't give a shit, right? Like, <laughs> hey, we're just going to do whatever. No, hey, if kidding. we're here, they're here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, during the CJ Lyons interview, it was so funny. There were like six times Dave's like, you're wasting your time. Stop it. 
So I have, uh, I do have a question that was emailed. <laughs> that, that was in... a great episode. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it was. We love CJ. Um, CJ, I did get a... the one who makes us all get along. <laughs> <laughs> she was the peacemaker, so... wasn't she? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I got a question via email about Kobo rankings, so I figured I'd wait for you to be on and ask you this. So um, she said she'd like an explanation of the Kobo book ranking system. It says the ranking on the individual book pages never seems to match up with the book ranking, particularly with a category ranking over 100. At some rank points, say 350, for example, there may be hundreds of books at that same rank. So just how does the ranking system work and how often does it update? And I have a second question after you answer that. By the way, I've never seen this. This is just right, straight off her email. I thought Ed Robertson would be able to answer this better than I could. He's um, on next week. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the way that the ranking works is uh, this is the, the, the number of unit uh, sales match. So there could be 50 books that are ranked 350 because they've all sold the exact same number. Mm -hmm. um, so there can be ties in the ranking. Um, particularly, I mean, you'll get a ranking even if you've never sold a book because you may be tied for last place with, you know, <laughs> a thousand other people. Um, so that's one of the strange that. things about the ranking. Now, the way ranking works on the top 50, and we have top 50 that's unique for um, U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, etc. So we have, you know, literally, you know, 25, 30 different top 50 lists that are all dynamic. And I'll give you a perfect example is uh, uh, Joanna Penn. Uh, J.F. Penn had uh, written something specifically for us to, to tie in with the Dan Brown release of yeah. Inferno. There were three stories. And so everyone who played the game, everyone who downloaded the three free stories, we said, you know, just a reminder, I think it was last Tuesday when Inferno went out, we sent an email out that said, uh, just a reminder, Dan Brown's book is out today. Thanks for playing The Descent. I mean, somebody won $5,000. That was cool. Um, if you like the stories, uh, here's J.F. Penn's Arcane series and a 75% off coupon that you can use on any one of them. So what had happened uh, was that day, um, she hit the top 50 overall in Canada and the U.S. I think she awesome. may have hit it in the U.K., but she couldn't see that she was in the top 50 in Canada and the U.S. Oh. So uh, oh. it was kind of interesting. <laughs> I, I sent her some screenshots to say, hey, congrats, you hit like, you know, <laughs> number 34, which was kind of cool, especially since the Brown got released today, too. Yeah. Um, but so a couple things. We are building uh, the ability for authors to see their ranking in territories that they don't normally see. So you might be number one in Australia, for all you know, but you can't tell because you're in the U.S. So I think that's important for an author to know because you could be trending somewhere and just not know. You could be like David Hasselhoff in a foreign <laughs> country being a big rock star. You could be killing it in Japan and not knowing it. You could. Yeah. <laughs> um, um. So the ranking for top 50 changes every hour. It's very dynamic. The ranking in the item classification, like the detailed item classification, is a lot more sluggish. And that's something that's going to be uh, tweaked and adjusted in the next few weeks where it's going to be a little bit more dynamic, but it is based a little bit more on, on historical, whereas the top 50 is based hot right now. Um, so that's, that's some of the differentiators between the main top 50 and the, and the classification rank. Does that, does that answer the question? I, to my understanding, uh, do, people, do people browse those? So we've gotten a lot of information. Uh, I just read David, David Gogren's book, Let's Get Visible, which is mainly about Amazon. So. Uh, there's a lot out there about the way the behavior of people when they browse Amazon. So, for instance, people browse the top 100. So, on Kobo, do people tend to browse the top 50 genre, the top 50 overall? Do they tend to search? Do you know any of that? They do. Uh, the top 50 is very heavily browsed, uh, especially when people are looking for the next great thing that they haven't discovered yet. So, so, so getting into the top 50 is is good. It, it helps you. Um, I watched uh, I watched Joanna's books after you know she hit the top fifty, and then I watched what happened, uh, and it was a good. It was a nice positive effect. It also helped increase her ranking in the actual specific categories of fiction that she was in. Um, people do search, but then they also still browse when they get to a particular category. So they do. They will, and they typically don't go beyond the first or second page. So usually if you're within the top 20, that's a good sign. You'll probably stay there for a while. 
So does Kobo have, I mean, one of, one of the best things about Amazon, which sets it apart from Barnes & Noble and Apple and pretty much everybody else, is your recommendation system. They, they pretty much know what you want to buy before you know. Does Kobo have anything that, 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 that kind of does the same thing, like recommends uh, books? If you like this, you might also like this. Yeah, we have some automated recommendation engines that are based on a combination of temperature, uh, which is how it's selling uh, now, like how hot is it recently, and how related is this title to other titles uh, in, the, in, the, in the catalog. And a lot of it's based on user uh, libraries. So, for example, I think um, I might have done this when, when, when Johnny first added his titles to the database. I think when I searched Johnny, I ended up getting some uh, Yesterday's Gone titles, probably because there were already people who had both books in their library. So sometimes it can work really, really well. So if somebody has the new Dan Brown in their library and they also have, have if enough people have the, the same two books in their library, that creates a relationship so that when you're looking at one book, you get that little list. And it's a banner. It's about halfway down the page. So if you're looking at books on the web page, um, they're based on uh, libraries. Um, they're based on lists. So I think there's a the 30% off long weekend list, and I think like the Alley Pimps I saw was on that list. Uh, for using Fat Vampire the, 2 is as well. Fat Vampire 2 is on the list, 30% off Spring Save or something like that. Because that's on a list with a whole bunch of other titles from both you know, KWL authors as well as traditional publishers, because we, we don't differentiate, we, we put them all together. You could be looking at a, a new book that just came out from Random House and see uh, you know, see one of Johnny's titles on that uh, on that list, and so it's based on a number of different uh, elements. And if, obviously, the higher probability that there's going to be a match between A and B, uh, the more likely it's going to show up on lists. So it is quite dynamic. Uh, the algorithms continue to change. Uh, that's why we need people like Ed Robertson to tell us what's going on. <laughs> you higher <love> Ed, <laughs> you should. Um, do you? Do you? I don't know if you can answer this. Uh, literally or like if you're allowed to answer it but d d can you give us any indication of how many sales over what period of time it takes to hit that top 50 it actually depends on what's going on in that territory now so the worst time for you to launch a book is when Dan Brown launches his book <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> no no when you think about that and this is and this is some of the other so we make uh, you can actually make your book available for pre-order on Kobo and pre-order also your temperature starts to go up before the books even released which is kind of cool uh, well it looks like we just lost Dave we or lose him could, all the time you oh, could okay. put books out every week right <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, you can put up books out every week but if you have if you have your you know uh, a release date time to a particular and you're trying to do a book bomb or any of the things where you get everyone to go buy it on the same day so you can kind of hit if you're trying to do it on a day where there's a major release coming out you're, you're not going to hit number one um, and potentially there's there may be other things released at the same time so it really is um, almost luck of the draw but I do know that the ranking within the category is a little bit more uh, based on long-term history. So the longer something's in the catalog, uh, the longer it stays on the on a, a number one. Like Blake Crouch, for example, he rode number one in horror on Kobo for a good six or seven months straight ahead of even the new releases by Stephen King because his his sales, long-term sales, had been far greater for any other books in that category, uh, which was which was kind of cool. That is cool. Now, for your for your t your top fifty, is the reason you guys don't do top hundred is because it's just wasted space, and most people never go past page two. Or um... yeah, I think most people most people will go on the top fifty. They'll they'll go all the way to to the end, but the the, the drop off after fifty is pretty significant. Uh, that may change uh, as as we move forward because that is a that is a popular list. But we also have, I mean, our merchandisers do spend quite a bit of time, and we have merchandisers in. Uh, you know, one for Canada, one for the U.S., one for the U.K., one for Australia, New Zealand. We have merchandisers in different languages around the world, and they each uh, set up their front windows and their uh, aisle displays. So, if you think about it, similar to the way that a bookstore uh, works, they merchandise things specific to their area. One of the things that uh, Shana and I do on the Cobra Writing Life team is we we poke them by suggesting that, hey, here's a title that 
you may not be aware of that looks like it could fit in this promo that you're doing. Uh, and we do that on behalf of the Kobo Writing Life authors, kind of the same way that a sales rep who's sitting down with a buyer at a bookstore mm -hmm. would say, here's the catalog for Random House, and there's a thousand titles in here. Here are the 30 you should really pay attention to. And yeah. that, that's part of what we do as well, trying to find those gems that um, could maybe uh, use a little bit Which more. Which is what uh, makes push. Kobo a great solution for our listeners, really, because, um, you know, mo I would say all, <laughs> most of our listeners are, um, are, are, you know, they're, they're independent. They're doing this on their own. And so... And I, and I have to tell you about the Kobo Writing Life bestseller list. Okay. which is not dynamically generated uh, and changed every hour. It's changed weekly. And what this is, is Shana runs a report from our ecosystem to find the top selling books. Then it's, it's sorted by authors. So you're only allowed to have one book on that it's best selling list at a time. Mm. So for example, when 50 shades of gray was, was hot, I mean, it's still popular, but when it was hot, you looked at any bestseller list and you would see the first five spots were taken up by five right. different versions of the yeah. same book. Well, I thought, well, no, 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 no. We have 20 spots for our bestseller list. Let's give it to 20 different authors. That's fantastic. Uh, which which is kind of nice because maybe you're number 21 and you never got on that list because someone was hogging two spots. So what we do is when you hit the Kobo writing life bestseller list, Shana will send an email to the author saying, congratulations, you've hit the list. And if you hit the list uh, with more than one title, we'll say, we plan on putting this title because it sold more than that title. We're not going to put the second title unless since we're, you know, since we're touching the list up a little bit, unless you'd rather have the second title there instead of the first one. Um, now, hypothetically, what if um, uh, Yesterday's Gone Season 4 and Unicorn Western both do kick ass but one is sean platt and david wright one is sean platt and johnny truant good answer. we kick you off and don't give you any royalties sean off of any. unicorn <laughs> western i get all the royalties for that what happens uh well what happens is uh they're they're actually tied to two different publishing accounts oh fantastic uh, but they're also it's unique so the combination of of platt and wright and the combination of truant and platt are are different therefore they they qualify as a different author um, That's awesome. Do you, so, yeah, do, they, they how, what kind of sales does it usually take to get on that list? But 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 one second, you, Johnny. You should never launch the same time as the mega popular Platinum Right. It's like Dan. <laughs> yeah, it's well, like going against Dan Brown. Well, well the funny thing about <laughs> the thing about Platinum Right is that I've heard that sometimes they have trouble with their production schedule <laughs> timelines. There's a guy. Whereas Asshole. Realm and Sands is like every Thursday on the dot. <laughs> There's also a lot of strife there. It's like watching a marriage break up. <laughs> I hate you all. Uh, good times. How about that local sports team? Okay, so Mark it, was going to say something. I interrupted. Are I was going to say, Johnny? Dave, was that live or was that Johnny playing the I hate you all clip? <laughs> that was live. That was live. Wow. treat. So he did, actually did, did does Dave? say it over and over. <laughs> I hate you all. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, so I, I mean, can you share any of those numbers, or is it and it depends, or uh, I'm just, it I'm depends. just curious what I'm shooting yeah. for. Um, you know what? I'll, I'll, you'll find out when you hit the list. And, and again, it just depends <laughs> on certain certain weeks. You have to hit really phenomenally ridiculous numbers to make it. Mm -hmm. Other weeks, eh, it doesn't have to be as much of a of a pull. Uh, it, it's funny. I mean, we look at this. We look at the sales rankings around the world. And in different territories, you're like, well, what happened in you know what happened in Germany last week? I don't know. Suddenly something took off, and we're trying to figure out why. So um, I think uh, the Netherlands was a perfect example of something had been happening in the Netherlands for the last little while, where everyone was just going out and buying a whack of eBooks, and it was an amazing experience. Hmm. Um, so if, different if, things like that happen. If, um, if 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 an English version of a book like does phenomenally well in another country, say Germany or whatever, does it affect the Canada or U.S. lists at all? Does it give that book any weight at all when somebody from those countries are looking? If it's the same version, so if somebody uh, is buying the uh, English version in Germany, mm -hmm. that will still affect uh, the temperature of that title uh, across planet. It will affect the temperature more in that territory. So it'll start to rank specifically up in that territory a lot more quickly, but it will still affect that also bots and things like that. So a sale anywhere helps. 
Um, obviously, you know, for some reason, I don't know why, but uh, one of my titles uh, in Australia just took off two weeks ago, and I have no idea what happened. Uh, and and it was just kind of strange. It took off and then it went back to normal. And and I, God knows what happened. I, I maybe I mean I was on a podcast down in Australia. Yeah, somebody like, said something about it. Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, okay. So is there any weight given to price? So if you have one title that's two ninety nine and another one that's nine ninety nine, and they're both selling the same, does the one that's nine ninety nine get you higher on that list? Okay, no, n unlike uh, unlike the uh, the world's longest river, no, uh, you, you know where the the higher <laughs> price items automatically algorithm higher, um, but I will tell you uh, an insider tip. All so right, I want to hear If you this. have an awesome title that's ninety nine cents or two ninety nine, and it is the world's best uh, unicorn western uh, out there. It's just fantastic, and it looks amazing. And it's a new concept. It mixes genres. It's just exactly what the doctor ordered. And another publisher has put out a title that's just as awesome, just as perfect. You know, everything looks good about it, but it's nine ninety nine or twelve ninety nine. And I poke the merchandiser and say, oh, you got to check this out. This is an amazing book. You should check it out. It takes just as much effort for them to put the nine ninety nine book up as it would the two ninety nine book. And we only keep 30% of that. So considering that we're a business, what do you think the default position of the merchandiser is going to be? Do I put the really expensive book in the window? <laughs> where everyone's going to see it, or do I put the 99 cent book in the window? So there have been books I have tried to push and force the merchandising team into loving. And one of the challenges that I've had with that is uh, sometimes they say, I'd love to feature it, but you know that means 30 cents, whereas if we sell this other book, it means $3. Uh, no. So that is the human factor that will affect potentially uh, me being able to get something pushed into a, a primetime promo. Now, one of the things Gogren talked about in his book is how the other retailers, and I might have missed this, my internet had cut out, so if I did, just tell me you already talked about it. Uh, but, but it talks about the role of, um, you know, a, a physical hand actually, you know, creating and curating lists uh, at other stores rather than just sales alone. Uh, how much does the merchandiser affect uh, the, the lists at Kobo versus sales and stuff like that? Sorry guys, I'm getting kicked out of a meeting room, so I'm just going uh, <laughs> <It's laughs> to. What's raid? This is like one of those things where you there got the go. helmet cam and somebody's like, like a. Um, He's going to okay. the bathroom. I know it. There we go. No, no, no. no. I just moved uh, from one meeting room to another. A little bit of a. Awesome. Sorry, Dave. I missed the tail end of your question. Uh, I was my, my, my question. <laughs> my, my question was literally how, how much? Uh, how much does a merchandiser, you know? Um, responsible for the list versus sales uh, and an author's natural ability to you know, get on these lists? Is it, is it more like you know you guys are in control of how this appearing on the list? How much weight basically does an author have in landing on these top lists? So it all begins clear. with it all begins with the advice you guys have been wonderfully giving out since the beginning of this podcast and it continues to hold true write the best damn possible book you can give it a fantastic cover give it the best description for your target audience those are the factors that really really have an effect again then again you know the price point is a consideration so if we find something that looks amazing and is something that wants to be featured out keep in mind you're in competition with millions of other <laughs> properties out there um, and the merchandisers do have the ability to put it in the front window but they're only going to put stuff in the front window that's actually a good business decision. I, if I put this in the window, will it sell? And if I put something in the window that doesn't sell, what, what was that thing that I should have put in the window instead? And I mean, I, I've been a bookseller for uh, 20 years, and that was the thing I always considered when I brought books into my stores. I considered them tenants paying rent. Now, uh, with digital, we can take as many tenants as we want. We just don't have to put <laughs> don't have to put them in the front window. Sometimes they they get you know uh, pushed to the front window because customer demand says, "Well, this is so good that uh, it comes to our attention." But in a, uh, in a, the you know when you click on the category, and sometimes you see the first of all, how much does what would be a good target price 
to attract both reader and merchandiser Great if you're question. the author. So that that's the whole question. <laughs> that's the magic bullet. Um, so and who do we pay? Who, can <laughs> we pay somebody pay? directly? <laughs> who do you pay percent? And our high end of seventy percent is right. And and sometimes that's because of unit sales, but sometimes there's just that. And I'm sure you get that right. If you go from nine ninety nine to um, ten ninety nine, you're suddenly making less money. So the factor there is every book is unique and the customer is really making a decision that says how much is my time worth and am I willing to invest a dollar two dollars three dollars four dollars five dollars six dollars into this book um, I mean Dan Brown sold for sixteen dollars uh, the, the, the hardcover was fifteen dollars but the ebook was a dollar more and, and and we still sold a lot Wait, of the ebook was a dollar more than the hardcover don't get me started on our industry. <laughs> publishers, publishers are just, they need yeah. drool buckets. They need drool buckets if they're trying to pull that shit. Cause all no, no, no. The hardcover is $30, $30, but retailers were selling it for 50% off, which yeah. made it a okay. dollar cheaper. Right? Okay, that, but that just makes people mad. All that does is, I mean, good, good. I'm glad it's this way because Save like, it for we, better all off a, on that. <laughs> we all have our chance, all right? We all have our chance because they're being stupid. But come on, that's stupid. No, this happened to my daughter a couple weeks ago. She needed to buy a, a, a book for school, and the, she, could get, she could get it shipped to us for like $3. But it was like $14 on Kindle, and I just wanted to punch stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's... And that's uh... The, the beauty of the ebook industry, and, and you guys are good at that. I think the independent publishers, uh, the smaller press, are really, really good at paying attention to the market. And so, you know, if this were a, a smaller press that had done that, um, the left hand would have known what the right hand was doing. The left hand would have said, <laughs> wait a second, we're, why don't we drop the ebook price a little bit and maybe sell more units? Uh, and you guys can do that kind of thing because when you see that a book uh, is working at this price, you can immediately go in and change it, and it's not all that hard for you to go and change it on all the all the different platforms because they're all relatively easy to use. I mean, ours obviously is the best, but they're all relatively <laughs> easy to use um, and and relatively quick to uh, quick to the punch. So I think something that the publishing industry overall is needs to learn from uh, folks like you guys is that uh, you don't you don't just set a price and walk away. You set a price and you and you keep Adjust. an eye on the market and you can play with it um, and you should play with it because you want to I mean you really want to maximize that uh, maximum quantity maximum margin and find uh, and play around with it until you find that comfort zone now what, you know what? what? Ahead, I just have one quick follow-up uh, what what do specific genres command higher pricing in general do you notice oh, and if, if, if you, if you yeah. could give us some examples of a uh, yeah you know, of course where you yeah. should be, like if you're in an action thriller, is that high or lower? Um, you know, young adult, high or lower? Uh, any yeah. thoughts you have on that? Uh, I think uh, Mark Coker actually had published some some significant numbers. Uh, I don't agree with words. his numbers. <laughs> they, 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 they kind of almost match what I've seen, but I'll tell you one thing that we've noticed since we partnered with the American Booksellers Association. Um, books that sell through our, our partners of the independents in the U.S. tend to be higher priced, Tend to be more nonfiction than fiction. Uh, I mean, you know, romance, more active romance, um, thrillers, <laughs> mystery, sci-fi. Active, <laughs> active romance. Yeah, I think we more, know what that more is. Active oh, I romance, love yeah. that active romance. <laughs> so, um, those are the kinds of things that sell really, really well on our .dot com. Uh, when we branch into the U.S. independent scene. The price points go up quite significantly. Why? Because the customers who shop independent booksellers haven't been trained or brainwashed by Amazon to think that all books should be free or 99 cents. <laughs> um, they're used to paying more. They're used yeah. to, they would have walked into their independent bookstore and dropped $30 for the hardcover Dan Brown. So when they see the Dan Brown ebook at $16, they go, oh, good, it's half price. <laughs> um, but that's a good sign, and, and and what I love about that is the devaluation of what I mean. Writers need to make a living, for God's sakes. Therefore, you know, a dollar for a full-length novel? Are you kidding me? Like, how can I live off of that? Um, yeah. So I think there there are some areas. So specifically, nonfiction, social sciences, and more literary fiction tend to command a higher price point. Um, typically because of our partnership with booksellers, but uh, the, even on .com, they tend to command a higher price point uh, as well. 
And, and what are what what what's a what's the average price point for for uh, books like that? Is it four ninety nine? Fourteen ninety nine. Literary fiction, fourteen ninety nine. I think uh, we hit a we hit some high points between two ninety nine and four ninety nine out of the uh, writing life community. When mm -hmm. we move into more traditionally published titles, you're looking at six ninety nine to nine ninety nine is a little bit more prominent for even stuff in the same categories, and that's typically because um, you know users have been trained and authors have been trained you know to do the John Locke thing right to let me let me get some attention by, by putting in a low price point and then once I get the attention then I can uh, you know I can game the system and I can ride that wave uh, of course the algorithms keep changing but people keep trying uh, trying different strategies I, I have to tell you one really intriguing price uh, demonstration so Deborah Cook who's a romance author uh, from Canada now is this active or passive romance she writes uh, <laughs> semi-active semi-passive romance <laughs> no, she, 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 she comes from the traditional publishing scene and then she moved into self-publishing we were on a panel together talking about strategies for self-publishing and she she gave me this incredible stat that I was just uh, blown away by she had her book price at five ninety nine, dollars uh, just standard uh, romance ebook she increased the price by a dollar across all platforms. So here's what she found out after the first week. On Barnes & Noble, her unit sales, her average unit sales went up. On Apple, her average unit sales went up. On Kobo, her average unit sales remained consistent with the week before. And on Amazon, they dramatically dropped. She had been around long enough to know this is a long-term game. Typically, I, I would see an author go, oh my lord, my goose egg is gone, you know, my, my unit sales on Amazon were my strongest, therefore I'm going to just back out and say this was a dumb promo, I'm not going to do it. After a week and a half, her unit sales uh, stayed, stayed consistently higher at BNN and iBooks. At Kobo, they remained exactly flat, meaning she was just making more for the same unit sales. And on Amazon, they returned to where they had been before she raised the price, meaning she was making more with the same unit sales. Um, and all she had to do was wait two weeks, which, as we know, we sit there and we, you know, we'll hit the refresh button uh, just to see how we're doing on sales. If you're watching it every hour and you see your sales start to plummet, that's a terrifying thing. But uh, I was just fascinated to see that by increasing her book by a dollar across the board from four major platforms, she made more money. Yeah, that's why I disagreed with Coker. Uh, if we had read the same thing, T to me it seemed like he was saying to go with much lower pricing than what we had found success with. Uh, we found success at higher pricing, actually. Yeah, so, I think but, but it, I, I think I it's been more successful at a higher price. Uh, books coming in from Smashwords catalog typically are at a lower price point than the stuff that Writing Life authors are publishing. The, we're consistently a dollar higher. Uh, on average, yeah. You, I mean, you're 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 telling your reader what it's worth too, and there's a lot of Johnny and I have talked about this constantly. About you no, know, we want to do, we want to say we're Starbucks, the, we're worth the Starbucks that. latte effect, right? That, that that it is that we're worth that. I, you know, we 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 spend a lot of time on free, and we we don't want to train people free anymore, and we, we you know we're. Our work is, we work really hard. I mean, yeah, we write fast and put a lot of stuff out, but we work really hard. And it's not, we don't want to play the 99 cent game. We'll do it to our core readers on that first few days always. Because yeah, you're, re you're rewarding them. We're rewarding them. But yeah, we're not, right. there's a difference between rewarding a reader and saying we're only worth this much. Now, I know we're, we're really long, so we've got to go soon, but I really did want to get this point in the difference between the biggest river in the world and Kobo, which I think <laughs> is um, is something that, that you kind of touched on uh, a little bit. Uh, because you're small, Dan Brown's publisher shit the bed because they didn't, their right and their left didn't know, right? And Well, I they think, succeeded despite shitting the bed. So. Yeah, 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 but they like, could have shit it less. Yeah. They could have yeah. kept the bed a little cleaner. Yeah, a, a long long term, they still shit the bed because they are they are slowly like they are pissing people off, and the thing is, I've seen I've seen Amazon make some of the same decisions because they don't know what their right and their left are doing, and Kobo is clearly small enough to care. I mean, can you imagine getting um, 
you know, someone from Amazon on our show to talk to readers and to or writers. And no, there would be a lawyer next to them whispering in their ear the entire time, like it's a Senate hearing. <laughs> no, it's true. You know, before 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 Dave and I ever um, signed anything with Forty Seven North, I actually had a call with Amazon that was like it was because I knew somebody who knew somebody, and I got the call, and it was like setting up a meet with the CIA, and <laughs> the whole conversation was like the conversation was being recorded, and the guy was scared to say anything, and. And, and, and our Wait, you're not recording this, are you? <laughs> <laughs> they, it's just Amazon is a little bit too big, and you're not going to get um, – this was yesterday. So, so, Mark, I don't know if you heard this earlier, but we had a big snafu on how they were – you basically clicked on to the, the full saga for Unicorn Western yesterday, and it was priced as $0, <laughs> but it was actually the, the other one. It showed the cover that it was supposed to. It linked but, the two versions of the wrong book together. Yeah, and so that was the whole thing. And we, we got somebody on – Johnny got somebody on Amazon on the phone, and, um, and they said, uh, no, it's going to take five days to fix. And he said, um, he said wait, 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 five days? Like there's no way you can expedite that? No, sir. Except they probably didn't say sir. And then they were all they were all done. And literally, like by the time he hung an up, an hour over. Yeah, it an was hour fixed. later. And it had nothing to do with the person he was on on the phone. It just happened to be fixed from this earlier. It's it's very difficult to get two ends to meet with Amazon. And with Kobo, it is a smaller, more intimate environment where you're gonna get more attention. And let's face it, guys, that's what we need. We need we need care. We need attention. We need people who understand what we're doing and why at Amazon. Now I love Amazon. Amazon has opened tremendous doors for us and, and you know, uh, I will be loyal for a long, long time, but Kobo is special because they do everything that Amazon doesn't. Kobo is Kobo understands us and we're not just a number at Amazon. We're a number. And, and, and Kobo's dashboard will tell you how much money you are making. Why does Amazon not do that? Why is their <laughs> dashboard so incredibly shitty? Amazon, Amazon. There's a bottom line. Here's my. I, I'm number sure you. Mark doesn't want to sit here and <laughs> how much listen money to Amazon made. being trashed. No, no I, yeah, I, I hate I, that. I hate that. <laughs> Please stop being mean to them. I could dunk my head in a shit field toilet and feel less shitty than after leaving how Amazon's dashboard. How obvious is it to just have a bottom line number? How obvious is that? So you know what, guys? I think one of the, that, that's sort of a reflection of how we built the dashboard. And I, I mean, I sat down I with love, uh, love. Your presentation is yeah. off the hook. Thank you, but wait until you see what we have in store because a lot of a lot of the development that we focus on for the next sixteen months is specifically related to feedback from folks like you that say, you know, I like this, but I don't like that. Could I have this? Um, so being able to track free downloads, for example, is going to be added to the dashboard relatively soon. Oh, being awesome. able to go in and actually see your not just your sales history, but being able to say when was I last paid. Uh, or they, I know they emailed me a financial statement two months ago, but I lost it. Can I just go and retrieve it here? So those are the kinds of things that, I mean, you guys help make our system what it is, and it wouldn't be that yeah, but good the if point, it wasn't well, for you listening. Guys. The point is you're listening. Like, I, I don't think Amazon really cares what we're saying. You know, well, too well, big to care. And Listen. I don't, I don't want to shit on Amazon. We're, we're, nobody's leaving Amazon. No, Amazon's I do great. Love Kobo. Uh, but you're embracing I'm, I'm the world, stunned. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And 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 I feel I'm moving like, to Canada. Uh, <laughs> Dave's been saying that <laughs> since I met him. Um, True. No, <laughs> I, I cool. really it's feel dark. he's down with that. I think Amazon is amazing. They're a powerhouse, and they've changed my life. I love Amazon, but I I think Kobo's special, and those are two different things. And I think if you're an up and coming um, I'll say this. I would, and, and Joanna Penn said this, I don't know, nine months ago. I, I think that it's much smarter for a new, a new author, and we get this email all the time. You know, I think a new author is probably better set going with Kobo and Amazon and not going KDP Select at this point. I think that there was a time when I wouldn't have agreed with that statement. Yeah. But I do now. I think, I think everyone listening to this would be well served to not do KDP Select and to, and to just launch at Kobo and too. The fact that we're going to be adding new books to Kobo every, every week, I just week. love yeah. that. I just love and, it. And I, I think that we're, too. Yeah. we're putting our money where our mouths are, I think, because we decided last week uh, 
and this is a scary proposition. Yesterday's gone season four. We were going to make everybody else wait 90 days and do the Amazon exclusive and use the promotional tools. We're just going to go flat out to everywhere immediately. So, and On behalf of your customers around the world who don't read Moby Files, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and it scares the hell out of me that it won't have oh, that yeah. push. But <laughs> maybe, you'll get me aware of all these uh, maybe you'll get pushes elsewhere. From, yeah. I mean, you have Canadian fans who are obviously reading it on our platform. Yes. We're probably itching to read season four. Uh, I'll give you a recent example. I mean, I love season uh, season one. I haven't started season two yet. I took a chance and I picked up this crazy fat vampire thing that was free. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Read the whole thing on my flight down to Colorado last week and immediately went and bought number two. So that was a drug that worked. And the you same didn't thing. Get the whole, the, the, you didn't get the missing. value meal? <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to do it one by one. It's, uh, there's more, more money in it for Johnny that way, right? <laughs> your tagline can be Kobo buys your books. I'll bet those people at Amazon are just taking them and reading them. <laughs> <laughs> that's an example. It's like that's taking an pencils. <laughs> you know, now it's available. I mean, I remember I really, really wanted to read Yesterday's Gone, and I was poking you guys because I didn't want to buy it on another platform. I wanted to buy it on the reader that I like reading on, Kobo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Mark, we're, we've gone way over, and thank you for being so generous with your time. I could keep going, but... We'll Guys, just have to you know what, I'm, I'm a huge fan just, of the podcast. I, I appreciate I being on, and uh, may you have lots of sales everywhere. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. It was great. Long you. and prosper. <laughs> what up? Thanks so much. So uh, everybody, check out check out Kobo. It's awesome. Um, and then uh, a Unicorn Western Saga is still free if you're watching this live. If not, oh, Sean, we got to start announcing our weekly releases. It'll be Unicorn Western Five. <laughs> At that's 99 cents or something. And I said free. That's wrong. That's wrong. We're not Genesis doing that. With a new cover, uh, so Johnny. Again, we have a new thanks. Genesis cover. Um, leave a review for awesome. Full Saga. And Dave's got hops Woo! going there. So that, that'll be Dave's plug. Uh, so again, thanks, Mark, for, for being on. And uh, we'll see everybody on the podcast next time.